Good evening, everyone. Good evening and, and welcome. My name is Chris Lupkeman. I have the great privilege to head the Strategic Foresight Hub within the Office of the President here at ETH Zurich. And I will be your host this evening for our hour together, our hour and a bit together. And we have an amazing dialogue set up for us tonight. What a question. The Nobel Turing Challenge, creating the engine for scientific discovery. When I was asked if I'd be interested in, in, in hosting this for, for us, it's like, wow, an AI winning the Nobel. Wow, just think about what that really means. This is what tonight's gonna be about. The ETH, the ETH Global Lecture Series is a platform for contemporary topics to be discussed with outstanding global thinkers. Each month, we bring one or two amazing people together to discuss their personal insights, interests, experiences, and expertise. In addition to simply satisfying our curiosity to learn, we also hope that these dialogues will expand all of our perspectives so we broaden our thinking, challenge our own opinions and preconceived notions of perhaps normal, and through this, make an even more meaningful contribution to society. Our time together this evening will be 60 minutes. After our guest makes a short presentation, I'm gonna be asking him a few questions, and then you'll have a chance to ask questions as well. So please, while he's making the presentation, think about what you might want to ask. I would suggest maybe write it down, because as it goes, it's gonna be more and more and more interesting. You might forget the early one. And, um, and then I'll ask one or two, or three or four or five to go. You ready? Oh, that was terrible, come on. <laughs> I know it's Friday, it's been a long week. <laughs> Are you ready? Yeah. yeah, yeah, thank you, that's it, there you go. All right, this evening, the most difficult thing for me that I figure I'm gonna have to do is actually to introduce our guest, not because there's nothing to share about him, rather quite the opposite. It's hard to know where to begin. He's worked intellectually in physics, computer science, computational science, robotics, computational robotics, systems biology, artificial intelligence, speech and pattern recognition, and the list keeps going on. He is the director of an institute and advisor to many companies, the president and CEO of at least one major business unit of Sony, the CTO now, a recognized scientist, leader, academic, a founder, and for me, one of the most important things, I think, for him as well, a very respected and valued mentor. He is the key person in giving birth to Sony's robotic dog, Aibo, and also the co-initiator of RoboCup. But what fascinates me most about what he's, not what he's done in the past, but what he's working on right now, amongst many things, one is to create the world's first robotic iron chef. Again, think about what that means, to make a robotic iron chef, a Michelin chef, that's a robot. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Hiroki Kitana. <laughs> Thank you, Max. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much for a kind introduction. Now, I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me for this uh, uh, global lecture series. Well, today I would like to share with you a rather provocative and I think an ambitious project which uh, I'm pushing right now. And uh, you know, this is not a kind of uh, uh, you know, talk where the research has been completed. Rather, uh, you know, this is a talk inviting you to join the effort. Okay. So the project I'm launching right now is called Nobel Turing Challenge. Okay. So as uh, was introduced, like, uh, this is the attempt to create like, an AI system that can make a high impact scientific discovery autonomously, or at least like a semi-autonomously. And the, you know, some of the discovery may win a Nobel Prize, but like I think, uh, uh, and I'll talk about the, how things are going to unfold. Okay, I think we just want to have a, a slight uh, switch to uh, yeah, my presentation, I guess. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. 
So, no, when I set the goal for any kind of these projects, like I try to uh, uh, comp create like a, a AI system that can make a major scientific discovery that was Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine by 2050. Well, it doesn't really have to be physiology and medicine. Uh, it's just like, a, a, you know, I'm a system biologist, so like, a, you know, that is a field I'm working on. It can be the chemistry or it can be the physics as well. So it doesn't really matter. At the same time, in the reality, it doesn't really matter whether this machine will win the Nobel Prize in reality or not. I just want to make sure that the level of the challenge, level of the discovery is significant enough. You know, people might consider, wow, this is Nobel Prize quality or probably even beyond. And uh, I don't, you know, as a, uh, you know, the way of communicating uh, to the uh, people about like a, where we want to where we're going to go in this challenge, I'm just using a Nobel Prize because it's easy for people to understand, you know, what I'm talking about. It's just like when you just say like a scientific discovery by AI, it's there. You know, sci AI scientific discovery has been a long, has had a long history starting from the dendro, metadendro, and it's, it's there. But just like a, a, we want to have something really in high bar, you know. So that's why I just use the uh, uh, term Nobel Prize. Now, this is RoboCup, you know, some of you may know, and uh, we created the uh, uh, challenge uh, similar to the, uh, you know, Nobel Turing Challenge. Well, this is original, like, so I'm copying the RoboCup into the Nobel Turing Challenge, actually. It's a developed fully autonomous humanoid team to win a FIFA World Cup champions in soccer. So we started the uh, uh, inception concept in, back in 1992, and we announced the uh, uh, each guy in, uh, in Montreal that we're going to start the project, and the actual uh, initial uh, competition started in 1997 in Nagoya. And after that, like a series of high quality papers and a spin-off uh, came out. We have like a small size league and a middle size league. Now we have uh, several humanoid league, and we expanded into the uh, RoboCup Rescue and RoboCup uh, Junior, which is a, a huge educational activity right now. And uh, now we have RoboCup uh, at work or RoboCup at home. You know, it's growing. This is competition-based research. So it's not just like, a, you know, uh, having a fun with the competition. Uh, we usually have, uh, always, always, always have a symposium, a workshop associated with the competition. So like a winning team have to disclose what they have done to win a game. So it's not just like a winning and a keep it secret. Winning and sharing, so they make a progress. So that's how uh, RoboCup gets started. And also, like you know, choice of Saka is not random thing. We envisioned what is the most critical thing in the robotics and AI in 30 to 40 years from now. In the, from now, that means from the 90, you know, 1992, the early 90s. We consider that would be autonomous driving. At that time, people saying ITS, or robot, robotics for the logistics, rescue who are carrying the elderly or handicapped person at home, and probably some other uh, service robotics. Uh, all these involve real-time interaction with multiple moving objects involving the human intentions uh, as well. Combine them together, what is the best way to push a technology that would be important in those aspects in, in like a 30, 40 years uh, you know, of the time frame? You know, initially, we thought about uh, uh, rescue, bad idea. Disaster is very different in each country, so no one agree on this. Like, uh, you know, Japan is earthquake, and uh, uh, someone in uh, earthquake-free areas, uh, no, 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 we don't have that. You know, so, uh, and then also, like, uh, we thought about, like, uh, uh, elderly care, but you might have, like, a much easier solution uh, rather than using robotics, and we can beat that in a short range. In the long run, maybe, but in the short run, uh, people think, oh, why you do this? And we decide to go a little bit detached from the real world, possibly the gaming, over the sports. And then we come up with, ah, soccer game. OK, this is a global sports and dynamic interactions. And you contact the people, but you have a yellow card and red card. And the other alternative, baseball, well, baseball in the US and Japan and Taiwan and other areas, but it's not really the global sports. And then most of the time, the pitcher and batter, so it's not really dynamic, right? And we thought about like rugby and American football. We can build the uh, very strong, robust robotics that you just uh, keep, keep, keep people out. And uh, you don't want that kind of robot in a daily life, right? So uh, we need agile robotics with dynamical conditions and contact with the people, because that happens in the daily life. But a robot is you know, not supposed to harm people. 
So the SACA is actually the ideal uh, platform. And that's why we picked the uh, SACA. And it turned out to be very successful. And we got a lot of uh, high quality papers. And the SpinNet, one of them, is a Kiva system, which is funded by the RAF. <laughs> and uh, you know, that was later acquired by the uh, Amazon Robotics, Amazon, and it became Amazon Robotics. A dramatically changed the logistics the automations, the warehouse uh, automation. Uh, this was a really the big game changer what the Kiba have accomplished. You know, so like an initial idea of Robocaf, like uh, one of the uh, uh, key area could be the robotics, uh, uh, you know, logistics and, and other areas, has been sort of accomplished in a way. Uh, with, uh, but, like, we have like a more to come, and a lot of uh, active uh, uh, research and spin out uh, flowing out from the Robocaf activities worldwide. Now, you know, we have, have to still work hard to achieve the 2050 goals. But Robocaf is a kind of intelligence, physical and agile and reactive. Okay. So I thought about like a you know, really different kind of challenge. That is to, you know, not necessarily the real time, but the deep thinking and more, a very complex environment or a very complex uh, problem to be solved. Not, not saying that the soccer is not very complex, but uh, you know, something really, uh, really fundamental. So I thought like a scientific discovery would be uh, you know, really uh, important thing. That might change the, uh, our civilizations, the way we do science. And but look at the, uh, when I talk about this, like, uh, you know, simply it says like AI will make a scientific discovery, and they just say like, uh, maybe win a Nobel Prize. Okay, someone sitting in the front row said, Kitano-san, well, if you look at Nobel's uh, will, you know, it was given to the person, it's not AI, so it's not going to happen. <laughs> okay, okay. Then I thought I've got a little bit tweet, tweak on this. Like, uh, you know, what happened if you got a tuning test? You know, are we going to, are we able to create like a machine that can make a major scientific discovery, which itself is uh, significant enough? But at the same time, if you build that one, how is this machine going to behave? Are we going to have a distinctively machine-like intelligence so we can immediately tell, well, this is discovered machines, not human? Or is it going to mimic human behavior so people might not be able to tell, okay, this is like a human or not? But also, well, of course, like people can say, like, you know, those people you know, should be showing up in a major conference or anything. But like, you know, some people never show up in a conference to write papers or like, you know, just like a Zoom. And if you like a virtual character, you may be able to uh, distinguish. So it's possible that the uh, uh, people may not be able to trace uh, in a distinct, uh, you know, for differentiate whether the human or not, uh, or AI. But at the same time, the way AI make discovery could be very different from the, what the human does. So like, uh, you know, if you look at the, all the publication of papers, you can immediately tell, oh, human cannot do this. So this must be AI right away. You know, you know, so that would be interesting. So in a way, it is a challenge and a question. Challenge is whether we can build a system to make a major scientific discovery, which is interesting and significant. The same the question is, if we build a system, how that system looks like. Is it going to be like a human-like, or is it a very alternative form of intelligence are we going to get? So that, that's actually the essence of this challenge. So in a way, outperforming, and imitating humans. So outperforming is a challenge, imitating, imitating human, this is that kind of uh, question. And we see many games, AIs outperforming chess, you know, Shogi and a Go, a StarCraft, Dota, and then Gran Turismo, Diplomacy. And uh, you know, even the uh, art fair, like uh, you know, uh, mid-journey generated art form, uh, you know, art piece uh, won the uh, award in the Colorado art fair. Okay. Now in terms of imitation, like, uh, you know, big thing, <laughs> right now, the chat GPT, people just like uh, having fun, I guess. You know, when I started talking this five, six years ago, you know, people just laugh at it. You know, people, you know, the AI writing papers and, uh, you, know, if, uh, you know, it's confused with the reviewers, not going to happen. Now, I see ML, you know, issues a notice, you're not going to submit anything written by the chat, chat GPT. <laughs> And, uh, you know, a lot of uh, interesting discussion going on. Like, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, like some of the papers says, like, uh, chat GPT as uh, one of the authors. And, uh, you know, the, well, of course, the journal don't like it. You know, so, like, uh, five years ago, when I talk about this, people say, like, oh, it's not going to happen. But now, uh, you know, although it's not really discovering anything yet, uh, you know, became really interesting discussions, 
you know, whether we can distinguish what has been generated by the AI or not. So that's uh, uh, things uh, uh, find it interesting. This is a really dynamic and moving field, at least. Now, one of the predictions, or you know, which actually made opposite because of the chat GPT recent days. Like I thought like uh, if uh, AI signif you know, became significant enough to make a discovery and write a paper by itself, novel committee were going to have to have a background check. And if they start doing this, this is our win. But now like uh, with chat GPT, like uh, you know, uh, you know, conferences start doing this kind of thing already. So I have to come up with another prediction again. Now, the two sub goals, yeah. As I already mentioned, like one is to develop AI and robotic system that can perform the scientific research fully or highly autonomously that leads to major discoveries. Okay. And they have to get the strategic choice and then, uh, you know, all, all kind of things as well. The question is, like, uh, uh, would such a system behave human-like well, very differently? And I my gut feeling is I think like uh, the AI system will behave very differently. Uh, in a way, if that is the case, it's opened up a huge opportunity that the AI and the human science can work together with a very different form of intelligence and probably compensate each other. And that would be very interesting, uh, you know, good future as well. There's another reason why, you know, proposing a challenge, aside from the RoboCup is more agile physical, and then uh, this is a more deep and, uh, you know, non-real-time thing. I've been working in biology last 25 years now. Well, almost 30 years if I look at this. <laughs> okay. And uh, one of the first projects I did is uh, aging. And uh, working with the uh, Professor Shin Mai, who is now in uh, Wasu St. Louis. And from the, this is like a you know, very sketchy diagram of that, uh, how things unfold. So we have the problem definitions, uh, started working on this in 1994, and then we did the hypothesis creation, computational modeling, and then we published a couple of papers. And it took a Two decades, to actually, those hypotheses has been experimentally verified and going to some of the idea going to clinical trial. It's long, long period. And with this process, only place that we did the ex exhaustive, uh, uh, you know, hypothesis search is in the computational modeling. And that part, we scanned, uh, you know, many parameters that come up with like a model that can fit multiple data that seemingly inconsistent. You know, for that area, it's uh, really systematic. But at the same time, the interpretation of that is that we have to think, like, okay, this is a, if this is a mathematical, uh, you know, uh, framework which can give the consistent uh, simulation result with the uh, numbers of data, this must be, you know, what is the molecular mechanism which represent, which is, you know, represent these mathematical models? And that was actually our interpretations. We've been lucky that interpretation was correct. So the later days, that was explained and verified. It could be wrong. And that part, if we automate in AI, or AI suggests the all possible molecular mechanism that is consistent with mathematical uh, outcome, you know, so we are more certain that the uh, interpretation could be right. So like it's a little, you know, one of the process. But, uh, you know, we come up with like a, some hypothesis. So if, you know, this is like a chronology of the uh, when it has been experimentally verified. Now, at the same time, what has been discovered uh, in uh, uh, our study and many of the biological study is about explaining a mechanism of biological phenomena. Either it is the uh, disease or a drug effect or a fundamental basic biological mechanism, like a cell cycle, cell division, or uh, you know, differentiation, or what, you know, uh, among other things. And the, you know, at the end of the day, we want to be able to identify possible combination of molecular mechanism and what molecule involve, not just one layer, within multiple layers, you know, many processes involved. So this is something most of the biological study is trying to uncover. Of course, there are other kinds of discovery as well, I understand, but like many biological studies, uh, you know, it's trying to uncover this structure you know, it's not just one layer, it's, it's complex. So like a multiple layers of the many process combined together. But, uh, but this is the basic elementary thing, one of the elementary thing the biology is trying to discover. Now, at the same time, this is a more on the uh, factual basis, like, uh, you know, very specific interactions. But this doesn't really include the conceptual discovery, which will be much harder. So we have to distinguish 
kind of discovery that the machine can do right away, or probably more challenging. You know, that this kind of uh, discovery of the knowledge from the paper and explain the verifications, I think a machine will be very good at it because like, we know the specific template, we know specific like, a way that we can direct the search. The harder one, which I don't know how to solve it at this moment, is like, uh, what is the conceptual thing? You know, so that, for example, like, uh, uh, when the sales cycle has been discovered, they are the uh, concept of checkpoint, for example. But those uh, uh, you know, biological concepts, how are you going to come up with that concept that explains multiple phenomena? And how a machine should be able, can come up with the concept, conceptual discovery? That would be much more challenging. You know? So I'm not really saying that you know, we can immediately come to that stage, but uh, we can start from uh, this kind of uh, uh, discovery as well. And then I you know, checked, uh, look into the, uh, what is the trace of discovery uh, leading to the uh, Nobel Prize. And, uh, Professor Shinya Yamanaka at Kyoto University uh, discovered the IPS. And first, he you know, searched for the uh, large scale database called the Phantom Database and identified 24 genes which can involve in the cellular reprogramming. And he put everything in it. He found out that like, a cell can be reprogrammed. And then uh, he go for the leave, out, leave one out experiment and identified the Yamanaka factor, which is the four elementary genes that will make cell reprogrammed. So this is basically the search and optimization process. Of course, in the middle, it's more complicated. You know, I'm grossly simplifying here. Uh, but you know, fundamentally, this is search and optimizations. And uh, Professor Shirakawa's uh, uh, Nobel Prize in Chemistry on the conducting polymer is the, uh, one of the intern from the Korean electronics company, uh, electric company uh, in his lab, uh, screw up an experiment. Uh, put the, uh, some chemicals in a thousand times uh, more dense than it's supposed to be, and they come up with the uh, uh, thin polymer. You know, this is really like, uh, you know, if we're the computer scientist, this is like a search on the completely out, out of the uh, regular boundary of the parameter search space. Now, so it's a huge random sampling process going on here. Uh, and then he optimized it to uh, the stable polymer generation. And with the professor uh, Mark, uh, Mark Damian and Alan Higa, he actually uh, further defined that the uh, process to have like an electric conducting polymer. So this is like a two iterations of search and optimizations. Of course, I'm grossly simplified. There must be, uh, I, I'm sure that there will be other type of uh, biomedical discovery or like a discovery in general, but like, like a, even this level of the major discovery, you know, with the gross simplification, we can consider this a search and optimization. So if that is the case, Quite substantial part of the research activity we are conducting can be automated. Now, the third reason I thought like a, this like AI, uh, you know, making discovery would be great is that limitations, for example, like a system biology, come from our cognitive capability. That's my conclusion. So after pushing system biology of 25 years, now system biology today have very small or medium size, well, like a sizable, uh, small, I think it's a relatively small model, I would say, with high precision, mechanistic model, like all the parameters there, all the interaction being computed, or a large scale model with a statistical analysis. No one succeeded after 20 years of system biology, large scale mechanical model with a precision. Simply, it's not there. And the reason why is we can do the small model, but like a scale into that large scale model is very difficult in terms of you know, cognitive capability because it's so complex. And also, it's very difficult to have like a, all the parameter experimental verified bring into the model. Because like a, you know, many of the parameter, you spend like a probably six months identifying the parameters. It's not going to anywhere because like a, you, know, you identify the parameters. It's not going to be the paper in the nature. So then if you are uh, assigned like, uh, your uh, PhD student, a postdoc, okay, can you do this parameter? This is important. Oh, probably not going to be the paper as well. As the, oh, what's my career? <laughs> Where's my career? You know? So it's going to be the sociological issues as well if, you, we, if human try to do this. At the same time, there's an information gap problem. That is like, uh, what's written in the paper. And there's a lot of uh, you know, knowledge is very implicit. You know? So that's like, uh, the way uh, we uh, communicate. At uh, the same time, phenotype in, in accuracy, I'm not going to that too much in detail, but like, I also call in the bias and minority problem as well. And this is the uh, interaction model or the cell cycle. I think this is the, probably the most detailed e-cell cycle model. We read 1,000 papers, more than 1,000 papers. 
uh, go into the very details of material, you know, of the, you know, ma material method and all the details, not just abstract. And then I come up with like a very detailed. This is the gold standard. And back in 2010, we cannot update this. Yes, many papers uh, in a sales cycle must be a, a lot more discoveries now. It's very difficult because uh, someone who's doing this can't continue this. I mean, have to go on. And someone you know, new arriving this and they look at this. Uh, oh, no, 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 I don't want to touch this, right? <laughs> Obviously. Okay. So very difficult. So, like, the only way we can keep updating is machine to be able to do that. You know? And also, like, we have like, all, all kind of bias. So when you read some sentence, we in, you know, implicitly inject like, some kind of bias. And that would deviate the uh, interpretation. You know, science is no exception. You know, there are a lot of uh, bias uh, here. Now, so that means like uh, there's a limit of human cognition. And uh, so even if we have like a large scale, uh, high throughput sequencers or all, all kind of like uh, uh, machineries, at the end of the day, we get a data, we have to scratch our head. And, okay, what's going on here? So this is like a textile factory in Cambodia when I visited there. You know, it's just like, you know, we are doing this in the final stage and there's all the machineries on the back but you know, the final uh, finishing, we have to do it in a manual manner. Uh, that, that's, I think, like a state of science today. <laughs> now, we want to change this. At the same time, process scientific discovery depends on serendipity by accident or scientific intuition. Well, pretty really undeniable process. Of course, this is the interesting part of the science when you do that. This is a kind of excitement when you have like a serendipitous ideas, uh, you talk to someone, ah, I get a great idea, that's the joy of science. At the same time, this is a pretty industrial thing, it's not really systematic. So can we actually make the science more systematic? Probably not everything, but like, uh, if uh, half of the science activity became automated, industrialized in a way, I think we're gonna have like a very different kind of science we can push. And the system biology, particularly, uh, you know, probably maybe other areas, because uh, I've been working on this, like I know the field, uh, is science for the AI. It's so complicated. It's not really human alone. It's not gonna solve the problem. So we need the power of computing and the power of AI. And uh, at the end of the day, we wanna create an engine for scientific discovery. That's what I wanna do. And of course, uh, Trying to make a scientific discovery by AI is not new. Uh, it's a traditional area in AI, like uh, uh, back in, even back in 1969, Joshua Reza by Bruce Buchanan and Feigenbaum come up with like a dendro and a metadendro, heuristic dendro, and the Eurisco, AM, and the Bacons, and the all kind of thing going on. And the most, uh, uh, so, and then the, the, those has been uh, actually getting data and trying to uh, discover the principle which has been already discovered at Kepler's law, I think. Now, what we want to do is not rediscovering something which has discovered. We want to rediscover something new and significant. And also, we need to automate the entire process, not like a, a starting from data which is already there. You know, we're going to have an experimental robotic system to be able to get the data, uh, you know, driven by the hypothesis. And uh, why automate? You know, two things. One is the hu superhuman precision, and second was long tail coverage. Okay, let me explain about it. Okay, okay, so this is like, a, okay, I kind of uh, screwed up in the slides uh, order, but like a, this is like a, one of the first closed loop system, which is uh, built by the Ross King. Uh, right now, uh, he's in the Chalmers, and this is the uh, uh, generate a simple East Genetics hypothesis autonomously, and then they go after the experiment. They just say experiment, go run, run the experiment autonomously and verify the hypothesis. This is one of the first closed loop system, no human involved. But of course, like I, the kind of experiment, kind of hypothesis generate is very limited. But still, I think this is a grand, landmark study uh, that human out of the loop. Okay. Now, let me go back to the, uh, uh, of course, like, uh, then uh, because it's automation, this goes to the old hypothesis, not just like one or two, right? That, that's one thing. And this is the uh, uh, result from the uh, Professor Natsumi at the uh, uh, Sansoken AIST, uh, uh, together with the uh, Robotics Biology Institute, which is the company uh, trying to use the robotics for the robot for the experiment. <laughs> Simple process as a PCR. Okay, if you got the uh, best human technicians, and compare with the uh, robotic system. Average 
is the same. So if you like, sum up the order result, it's the same. But deviation is significantly different. Like if you see like, up the manual, that's by the human technicians, and the lower side is the rubble uh, in the robotic systems. So this is significant because if this is a deviation so small, you see the signal out from the noise. You know, so this is a kind of precision, and can, this is repeatable. Right? And this is the kind of system he is using. At the same time, uh, you know, same system, or kind of same robotic system is used for the uh, uh, culturing the uh, uh, cell, uh, you know, differentiation process from the IPS to a pig eye pigment cell differentiations and the culture that. And this is uh, Masayo Takahashi's lab uh, together with the Koichi Takahashi's lab and then a company called the Pist Lab. And uh, you know, great point of uh, this work is before they introduced robotic system, only one technician in the uh, Takahashi Sensei's lab can really do this uh, differentiation and culture process at the medical quality. Very difficult process. This technician cannot take uh, any vacation or you know, have to be in a lab three months straight <laughs> until the entire process is complete. This is not sustainable. And with robotic system, they tune all the parameters to find, discover, OK, this is the parameter, uh, you know, steady state attractor. So th this is where it should be going, and they made it autonomously, and they made it more efficient, and obviously very stable. Okay. So this is like a, some of the revolution going on in using automations. OK, the other thing, I see is long, long tail. <laughs> if you look at this, like, this is a really conceptual chart, but like a temporal order of discovery. You might actually discover one thing, and you got this, uh, another thing on top of the discovery you made. And sometimes discovery goes linearly. So you discover something important, you discover something even more important based on the, your previous discovery. But not always the case. You discover something which is mm, not going anywhere. So you might think, uh, OK, I will continue on this line or just uh, drop it. But you might actually go one step further. You might have a significant discovery as well. And it's very difficult for us to keep going that because uh, you know you think okay funding finish or like I, you know my careers my contract and all kind of thing right so we can do this in machine you know and we can run the machine 24/7 and one of the in, in, in interesting uh, you know uh, one of the reasons I think this is important is this is like my study uh, together with the Hasesan and then other people on the uh, drug ability of the uh, molecule uh, proteins. In the, uh, uh, and then also like a, a, a interaction number, like a central, I think a, a K, this is the number of interactions of the, uh, each molecule, which is druggable. And this is like a human protein-protein uh, network. And this has been like a, a quite some time ago, so like a, it's not as dense as I wanted. Uh, but this is very consistent among the species. That's very interesting part. But then if you look at this, this is like a K is a number of interactions. And then the uh, vertical axis is the uh, likely food uh, that you know, molecule in that uh, beams uh, range is, can be the drug target. Okay. So <coughs> this area is high interaction number. This is very important genes, like P53, or you know, things like that. Okay. So like a lot of papers, very important, but it's very difficult to make it a drug target because of the, when you, you know, touch that, impact is so significant, it could be very toxic. So the, most of the... Uh, drug targeting the uh, molecule in this range is the anti-cancer drug. Okay, you can accept a certain level of toxicity much higher than the others. And then uh, the sweet spot is here, the 5 to 25. This is like a highly druggable area, which is basically on the backbone side. You know? So like, uh, it's really dealing with the specific functionality and the significant enough, but too significant. Right? And uh, the interesting you see is uh, this area. This is a kind of molecule which is not interesting so much. So not many people take, uh, pay attention to that. But if you look at the drug ability, it's reasonably uh, good. It's not going to be you know, highly druggable, but uh, uh, you have like a huge number of molecules like this. So if you can, you know, robot can go through the entire process of this area, we should be able to find a very good, uh, interesting drug target. But at the same time, chances you find that among the uh, large number of the possible target is very low. So again, if you ask a postdoc, okay, if we do this, and uh, probably you may not have anything interesting yet, and then, uh, you know, you can't really ask like uh, any human researchers to go for this. And this researcher found in their own curiosity, they may bet on this. And you can't really ask anyone else to just go for it because it might kill carrier. 
Okay. <coughs> now, so that's why I think automations and the uh, 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 you know long tail side will warrants the you know the precision of the long tail uh, effect warrants the automation. At the same time, we can do the experimental automation, but like, can, what, what can we do the hypothesis generation automations? And this is the uh, uh, diagram which actually shows the uh, automatically recovered interaction network. And uh, this is the two-like receptor pathway, mTOR pathway. And then uh, we actually hand curated the beginning. And then uh, we put the same bunch of paper into the AI system, which we built. And there's the, all the greens and then the connections. Connections are very difficult to see, but uh, it's something discovered automatically by the machine. So we have the 90% the recovery ratio. That's 90% of what has been uh, you know, uh, curated uh, by the human expert has been automatically recovered. Okay, so you know, this is some time ago. I think it's like we can actually go much higher. So automation of the uh, hypothesis generation, this is uh, more interaction, and this is uh, we are reconfirming what we know. So it's not really discovering anything new by itself, but it's possible that we, this kind of machinery will be able to come up with like, uh, new interactions which we haven't noticed. And uh, we actually push this further, and uh, <coughs> something we noticed, like, that machine not only generates what has been known, but generates something we don't know, we haven't really uh, recorded uh, in, the, uh, in the master map. And, and we noticed that some of the uh, interaction has been reported later days. Okay, then this might be predicting something uh, which has not been original literature and which can be discovered later days. So we tweak uh, our algorithm and then uh, recently published the uh, paper <laughs> We, you know, so this is a uh, you know attempt trying to identify the uh, possible relationship with some disease and the chemicals, and uh, given the paper uh, you know which has first initially reported that confirmed the discovery the relationship e e r y, and they gave the paper up until the year minus y, and then what is the certainty that the uh, machine says that this relationship the high with the confidence? So some of them have a 98, 95 uh, confidence, 61. But interestingly, some of the relationship has like a 70, 45, 58 confidence, relatively high, even if you just give like a paper year minus 10. Some of them, year minus five is pretty bad, like a 4%, 2%, you can't really consider. You know, so this is interesting, like, you know, we haven't really dig into what the reason behind this, but I guess, you know, so with this, we can really see if you go to like, a, if this kind of prediction mechanism is there, we may, 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 may not be able to capture that relationship well in advance for everything, but some of them, we should be able to find, okay, now this relationship is growing up in high confidence. Okay, there was something going on here. Let's run an experiment and check it. So that might speed up the discovery for probably a few months or a few years. You know, that, that's, uh, but at the same time, like, this hypothesis could be huge in number. So we might actually make it automatic. <coughs> now, now, I probably got speed up a little bit because I think like, you know, time is pretty uh, quick. Now, so like, uh, this is like, uh, you know, the uh, docking simulations. And then, uh, we did a Pearson correlation with the uh, conventional docking simulations and they compare with like, actual uh, experimental data. It's, uh, most of them pre, <laughs> not really good. And then we actually use the machine, uh, machine learning to be able to tell, OK, so this is like a, a machine, machine learning uh, we built on top of the system is that we have like a, those uh, docking simulations running in parallel, and with the targets, a protein target and ligand, machine, machine learning system is able to tell you which docking simulation you should believe. Because like a docking simulation has, uh, you know, constraints and weakness. Some of the kind of molecular patterns, uh, it's strong. In some other areas, it's not very strong. So the machine learning will be able to tell you which one to believe, and we get a very good result. And then we get the very selectivity was good, so like, uh, you know, for very practical at this moment. We need to train a specific area. Um, then we actually run the, automatically run the simulation, uh, docking simulation, along the entire network, not just like, uh, you know, we pick this and this and this, like, uh, you know, everything in the network against, you know, library test compound, this is the heat map. Once you get it, you can really compute a network result and the possible efficacy and the side effect. And this can be automated. And uh, when we're doing this, 
not many crystal structure, stru important structure was available, so we had a very difficult time. But now we see we have like a alpha fold two, and then a range of like a, a you know much better uh, simulation docking simulation. So we should be able to run the, all the process for the drug discovery uh, pretty automatically. So it's not going to be the scientific discovery. This is more the uh, drug discovery. So it's not making uh, any discovery in terms of the scientific concept, but still it's a practical, useful. The same concept that can apply for the scientific discovery can be applied for the drug discovery as well. Now. <coughs> So this type of discovery can be automated, and I think like, uh, you know, it's a matter of time, I would say. You know, more challenging is the conceptual things, which I don't have an answer yet. So uh, I, I think this, I would say this is the open questions. It's more challenging. But at the same time, if we can run for the massive search of the hypothesis space and the verification in a large scale at the precisions, we can, that part, we can just run the machines, and we can go further based on that kind of data. You know, that has not been done in the current science. We just have like a large scale genome sequencing and the protein interactions, but like a hypothesis generation verifications at the scale has not been done. But at the same time, if you got like, you know, uh, genome sequencing and expression profile, large scale omics study have dramatically changed the biology. So this is the omics for the, our hypothesis. Not just the omics for the data, not omics over the data has been going on for like the last 20 years. That revolutionized biology. I think the next revolution will be the omics of the hypothesis or omics of the knowledge is like, you know, one step further. So automating scientific discovery at the scale is something uh, we should be able to do. I'm probably gonna have like a layered structure, some kind of implementing strategy. And uh, to do this, we have to have a connected research lab and then every device and equipment have to be connected, and probably AI assistance for the, uh, each device and then, uh, each process. And then we got the uh, autonomy. That would possibly be a good uh, path to go. And at the same time, we have to have these closed loop systems. So that, you know, body of scientific knowledge we have, like a papers and database, and some of them may not have like an accurate report and the errors on the fabrications and all that. So this is really a twilight zone. Like, you know, we are not sure like which part of the knowledge we know is certain and what is uh, uh, error and what is more solid ground. And we have to come up with the hypothesis. You know, some of the hypothesis will be false from the beginning because they're based on the kind of uh, uh, erroneous uh, you know, knowledge on a database. But they verify that and they, you know, this process should be able to create much more certain, high confidence and knowledge. And this is the you know, legacy process, I, I would say. But this process is not here, not there yet. Yeah, you know. <laughs> so, so then this, oh, I just skipped it. Compare with this, uh, with the AlphaGo, for example, the Game of Go. Game of Go has like a you know, finite state and a huge finite. And then the initial version of AlphaGo come from the large scale data and then learn, and then how they predict what the human move, and then use the reinforcement running to outperform it. And AlphaGo zero, uh, get rid of the uh, initial data, get the random search, and then uh, that means search space has been dramatically expanded. You know, initial one search space is something about the people likely to play. Right? You know, AlphaGo zero, get removed the, the, the initial seed constraint, the seed bias. Okay, scientific discovery is very different. Some commonalities, scientific boundary is not clear, you know, possibly infinite. But at the same time, like we have like a, a knowledge and we can start from there. So you can do like an alpha goal strategy beginning and I got the uh, knowledge and they probably generate the hypothesis based on knowledge and then uh, try to expand that. So that would be initial reasonable strategy. You know, I don't know how we can go to the alpha zero strategy starting from the blank slate because uh, you know, state of space is so large. But if we can do that in a cons you know, some constrained space, even a, a subspace of uh, this large scientific knowledge, we might be able to search the area kind of hypothesis that we never thought about. So that we might come up with like a, a very different kind of hypothesis, which may, we may not expect to be discovered human uh, scientists in any near future. Well, in the long term, probably, but not near. So now also, when I talk about this, many people say, ask, what, asking the right questions is the most important in science, and how the machine enable you know, ask the right question to be asked. Now, this is critically important for human, because you have, to, you have the budget constraint. 
you have time constraint because you want to be successful as a scientist. It's not infinite. You have to be successful within the career. You know, you have successful within the budget uh, terms. So you can't really ask random question. You have to really go for the, uh, okay, this must be important. Or like uh, your curiosity, but still like uh, you have a limited resource in terms of time. So okay, you have to ask the right question. The machines, not gonna eliminate this entirely, but the machine can just go all kind of questions. So rather than asking right questions from the beginning, can we ask every possible question and the significant answer may be in there? So this is a, a you know, pretty dramatic change in the way we do science. And it, if this is ha happening, then uh, you know, uh, you know, the machine will have a very distinct patterns of discovery, different from the human being. And when, people, when we, we talk about like a, what is significant discovery, we don't know. That depends on the context. Something we consider small discovery could be the significant in other context. Or like, a, you know, someone discovers something else and combine it together, wow, this is like, a, you know, groundbreaking. Like, I think like one of the examples is CRISPR-Cas9. For example, it's, it's like, a, you know, for immune system of the archaea, right? It's very important to study in academically, but you know, people haven't thought about this is gonna change dramatic, change the world of the biotech. You know, so the, that kind of study, as the great thing of academia is you have a long tail. But if, can we actually mechanize it? You know, part of the long tail side. I think that'd be a very interesting thing. So this is the same thing. Now, uh, architecture, I'm not going into detail, but probably like a crowd, very distributed computing system. And then uh, the important thing is this kind of system, once it gets up and running, uh, should not be misused. And so previous uh, governance structure and the LC, uh, those things will be important as well. So, and uh, uh, last up, uh, we're starting a new project at OIST. This is uh, Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. Right now, the president, Peter Gruss, former head of the Max Planck. Um, but, but we are uh, starting a new project for the uh, automating microbiome multi-omics platform, discover something really new, because the microbiome is a huge you know, variety and variabilities. And combined with the human genotype and the phenotype and uh, you know, lifestyle, this is the combination is huge. And this is for ideal ground for like an automated scientific discovery as well. So we are looking into this. And uh, implications, we might have an alternate form of scientific discovery, an alternate form of intelligence, and, auto and probably accelerating science and unprecedented speed if we can make it happen. And uh, machine able by itself, we don't know. That's kind of open question as well. And so that is uh, uh, you know, the Nobel choosing challenge. And uh, I will stop uh, here. And then uh, it's not just myself, but like already uh, a number of institutions uh, working together. Uh, SBI, which is my institute, my private institute in Tokyo, and the Riken, and the Chalmers, and the CMU, and the OIST, and then uh, Alan Chung is and all those uh, uh, institutes already working. We have like a series of workshops going on right now, and uh, uh, supported by the uh, Office of Naval Research Global, and uh, JSD, COI Next, and the Quantum System Biology. And uh, uh, so I will stop here. And uh, uh, oh, before I forget, I just beat the Sony operation in Zurich. We have a serious AI operations uh, in Zurich, and we're going to expand. So not doing a scientific discovery, but we do sensor integrations and uh, AI foundation model, a lot of fun stuff. And uh, we are high aim. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Thank you very, very much. That's very, especially with the, the little the plea for hiring. You know, <laughs> every university student wants to hear that they have an opportunity ahead of them. So, thank you for that. I, I, it was a, again a tour de force, as you can. I'm sure I'm, I'm not if sure if everyone else understood. I hope you understood more than I did <coughs> because I was I got lost a lot in there. I have to say, but one of the things that I found quite interesting. We start with the end before we go to the beginning was asking the right questions. Yeah. Right, because at the end of the day, this is what every researcher is hoping that he or she yes. or they yeah. have found. Yeah. And how, how can you imagine, that I, I kind of got lost when you were saying how this could actually help us discover what this meaning of the right question yeah. might be. So this has been the interesting discussion, actually, when I gave this talk in one of the assistant biology conference, mm. uh, some of the very established uh, uh, researcher, very famous guy, says that, uh, you know, you, you may not want to actually align discovery with the human value system. 
hmm. because we are biased. So we might have like, a, if you go to like a, you know, more random open space uh, search, you might have something new because at that moment you think this is more important. You are injecting human values to them, mm -hmm. which you might have like a short term return because uh, you think this is important. You want to discover something you believe is important, but that's completely miss out something bigger, but you haven't thought about that would be important at that moment, mm -hmm. but could be important for you know, decades later. Mm. So you know, mm -hmm. asking the right questions, really injecting our value system right. at the same time, you know, practical constraints like right. a resource and the time. But that's an interesting potential conflict yeah. with some of our ethical questions, yeah, which, yeah, yeah. which is also human. Yeah. And we don't all share exactly the same ethics around the yeah, world. Yeah, yeah. So, but, and yeah, that, that's, help that's me with why, that one. But, you know, yeah. We don't have to really worry at this moment because like a machine is not there. Right. But when we start seeing, okay, when we start able to build one, you know, so the governance and the LC aspect will be very important because this machine can be misused. Mm -hmm. You know, could be actually ejected to such something very disastrous. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, like if we properly use this kind of machinery, you can have like a really the big discovery, cure many diseases, or a problem, sol solve like a climate issues or other discoveries we wanted to accelerate. Yeah. So like I, I think any technology, not just this one, but like any technology has Absolutely. both sides, like a governance yeah. and our wisdom right. uh, to how to use the new technology. No. It would be very important. I think that's a really good, great point. And as you are, to talk about it now yeah. and not ignore it, I think that's really, really quite wonderful. Um, I'm going to ask you one more question. Does anybody in here have a question they'd like to ask yet? All right, I see that's not enough hands yet. Sorry, you guys got to keep thinking. Come on, you can do it better than that. <laughs> but I will come to you in just a sec. Um, when we talked here, you also said this sort of about um, hypothesis verification, automating science discovery. So. It became kind of curious to me this idea of automating yeah, yeah, yeah. the discovery process. So what am I going to do? Yeah. So you know, you know I think that you know we can start using this kind of machine, which probably going to practice our next five to ten years, is to discover in scale the specific type of interaction, specific type of knowledge, mm -hmm. which we can define the protocol, define the boundary well. You know, for example, like even the uh, very simple organs like East. Or like an E. coli. Wait, 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 start. That was not simple. Yeah. That, well, that was not simple no, to me. But not, not, not simple, <laughs> but like, you know, but like, you know, simple compared to the like, you know, mammalians. Like, still, like, okay. you know, <laughs> only fractions of interactions has been identified. Hmm. If a huge part is undiscovered. Hmm. Okay. You know, untouched because yeah. uh, probably our, you know, value bias, who might cause that nothing interesting going on. But like, if a machine will be able to sweep the rest of it, we're going to have a comprehensive understanding of those small microbials, as well as like we might have a like chance, some interesting phenomena might be discovered from that. So, for, uh, sorry, one more, and then, you're, then it's your turn. So, but the idea here is then that I'm out of the loop, the human's out of the loop, yeah. and the AI is able to start thinking about which part of the interaction and yeah. everything, right? So, okay. help me with that So, one. I think two stages, two steps. First of all, we define, okay, we want to have like all the molecular interaction with the yeast or whatever. And this just runs, mm -hmm. okay? So we just like outsource, right? So that's easy, mm -hmm. but like probably we're going to have like something very significant. The harder part is more the conceptual thing, mm -hmm. you know, like a, you know, checkpoint or like, a, you know, some immunosuppression, something that we have like a biological concept coming out, right? That's more significant because that changed our view of the phenomena, give the semantics. You know, how a machine can generate the semantics, that's open question. Mm -hmm. So I think that what I say is that two layers. One is automating is whatever the factual basis or the discovery of the specific type of knowledge. Yeah. But the harder one it's going to be is the, the semantic, how we machine will be able to discover the semantics. Right. Yeah, that, that, that's I don't have an answer. Right, that would be very interesting. So like when, like when we're hiking in the Alps or someplace, or, yeah. and all of a sudden we have this, ah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what we're talking that's about. It, yeah. Okay, got it. All right. So, if you, you ha who has a question now? Okay, where are the mics? We have one mic here, one mic here. Here's a question right here, and there's a question right here. And then afterwards, we'll go up, up above. There's two more questions up on top. We're going to spread them out today. Yeah, so do you want, do you want to sit down? You want to yeah, stand? Sure, yeah, sure. Well, I, I, I find. Yeah. I think you like to stand. I can tell <laughs> that. I, I'm going to stay standing then. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Thank you very much for this fascinating talk. So, I was wondering about this um, 
accidents search and optimization mm -hmm. pathway. Is there any way how to automate the accidents part of it? Okay. Yeah, so that's a great question. I, I think the only answer I, I have now is expand such space. But you can't expand such infinity. You know, so you have a limit to that. So there's uh, some sort of arbitral decision involved. So that, that's kind of hard about. Like, uh, you know, if we can, we can expand the search space because the things will be taken care of automatically. But at the same time, if the real answer is beyond that the st step, you know, stay in you know, parameter regions, we don't see that. But at the same time, if we consider this, uh, uh, you know, phenomena has some sort of monotonic, uh, you know, curvature, then you see like, uh, you know, uh, 10 times more of those, like 100 times more of those, you see the difference. You can curve, extrapolate. Okay, if we got the thousand times, we may got we may got there. Well, if we drop off, then ah, okay, this is it. Or you just uh, just make sure, like okay, just one more stage. If this is a uh, valley and coming back, we're just dropping off. So like uh, I think a more active search would be required, not just like a sitting parameter automatically. So like uh, in an AI, there's like animated vision or active perception. I think we should have like a active perception in hypothesis space, and I think that would be a very mm. interesting uh, research. Uh, which, uh, you know, some people start working on that, but I think it's largely untapped. You sort of, as you were saying, I was just thinking of Harry Potter when the stairs just kept moving. Yeah. And then all of a sudden yeah. it just so makes you for go example, over like here. For example, like an animal, yeah. uh, like a you know, human being, actually he's trying to discover, like, it just moved, like, a physical emotion, and there must something out there. Right. And of course, a Rolf is, like, expert on this. Yeah, you know. interesting. Okay, there's another question over here, right here. Um, yeah, thank you very much. It was very interesting, but I ask myself, don't we have all the tools already? Um, if we take the language models that we now have, <coughs> they give us the basis to kind of tap into the knowledge pool of mankind. So if we kind of add some figure parser, mm. can't we then build like some mm. adversarial AI that tries to fool it um, with kind of figures that are not real? And okay. then uh, we implicitly encode what we now explicitly draw in kind of very complicated graphs. Yeah. Don't we have it all already? Okay. Yeah, but with what, what's available now, you know, I, we, you know, the field of AI made a significant progress last few months as well, and I think we should be able to come up with something that can uh, fool, uh, but probably like a, may not be able to fool like a very expert reviewer or expert judge, like I could be able to fool. So, yeah. to, 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 so. Yeah. Oh, I, so, probably, yeah, I kind of misunderstood. So, wait, Robo, Ro, so yeah. Robocop, that, Robocop, I'm sorry, it's not, it's, yeah. not, it's not Robocop, it's yeah. Robocop. That took 30 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It took a few years from idea to beginning of the project. Mm -hmm. when, did you, when did you put this out? Oh, this I put that like a five years ago. Oh, five years yeah. ago. So we're kind of at that point I think you're suggesting is all the, all the, the, the puzzle pieces seem to be here already. Is this what you're implying? Is that correct or no? Puzzle piece, okay, so I don't think we have like a, uh, I think we should be able to very quickly, but I don't think we have a very consistent hypothesis generation machinery. Okay. I think we're gonna get one soon. Yeah. Uh, probably regenerative, uh, generative AI or like a combination of that. But at the same time, generative AI is generating quite, quite random thing, you know. Yeah. It's not entirely random, but like we wanna be much more precise because like uh, then we waste our experimental resources as well. So, but I think uh, you know we can build that, and then experiment uh, would be much easier. But at the same time, like experiment will be limited, probably limited microbial cell so culture at the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, because like a mammalian, you know, uh, you know, mouse experiments, but automatic uh, possible, but it's kind of much harder. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, will you let us go ten minutes over? Are you okay if we go an extra ten minutes? We're going to vote. We're in Switzerland. We vote on everything. <laughs> okay, I mean everything. Okay. So who's in favor of staying an extra 10 minutes? Who wants to leave right now? <laughs> hey, look at that. That's the best vote we've had in years. This is fantastic. <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to let you carry that on later when we do the aperture, if you don't mind. We have a question up in the top. Go ahead. That's you. Thank you very much for the fascinating talk. I wonder, are you also interacting with the decentralized science communities that are growing up in places like Berlin? So I think one of the key questions is, we have resources, we have an AI, and now how are we directing what the AI is working on? Is it being a decentralized form where people are voting on it? Or is it then still centralized to the people who are controlling the AI? So. It would be really great to consider the decentralized nature of the future. 
Yeah, I think like, uh, you know, I, I don't have like, I didn't put like a slide today uh, because the time is limited. I think there's two possible architecture for this. One is obviously a centralized one. The, the other could be the uh, decentralized and uh, each, you know, uh, system has their own characteristics and they start talking to each other, for example. You know, so the advantage of this is like uh, initial touch space is much smaller uh, in a decentralized version, which have like a, each AI scientist has their own domain or the character. So probably like a, within that area, probably a progress will be much faster. Uh, then they start talking to each other. You know, then uh, if you have like a very, you know, for centralized one, such a space is uh, too big to come up with something meaningful initially, but could probably low, slow stuff maybe. But at the same time, the risk of the decentralized one is that because of the uh, smaller search space, they might develop like a specific characteristics which actually uh, bar some of the uh, search space or uh, like a discovery uh, is kind of, uh, you know, skewed from the specific areas. Well, so we need to have like a, a redundancy there. So we may have like a multiple agent uh, going on a, uh, you know, similar area of overlapping areas so we can cancel off the uh, uh, bias of the discovery pass. Well, you know, but this is completely new kind of architecture we're talking about, like a new kind of machinery. So I could be completely wrong. You could have like a one big uh, centralized like, uh, system which will discover everything. We don't know. Uh, but at the same time, this is, the, you know, this requires a huge computing power and the large, large memory space as well. So like one of the practical limitations is how you're going to manage that. Mm. You know, how you're going to manage the computing time. You know, I'm going to have like a bunch of GP, GPU or like we're going to have a completely new kind of computing architecture. Or like, how are you going to share the data? So like, if you can have a large scale data, uh, like uh, the genome data and the other data as well, that even now, like a practical problem is where you put the data. Hmm. And the data transfer from one place to the other is extremely expensive. Hmm. So we have like a bunch of like hypothesis generators. And where are you going to start the hypothesis? And how are you going to access them? But it's kind of interesting yeah. because maybe this is a, a perfect example of what yeah. quantum computing will help with. Possibly. Right? Possibly. Yeah. You know? I mean. Yeah. Hold on two seconds. We've got a question up here, then I'll let you have the last one because then we're going to have to end. <laughs> Thank you. Here. Thank you. So um, we all know how difficult it is to get rid of biases, especially if they're hidden. So by uh, elegantly leaving out the question uh, about uh, self-improving machines, I assume you are still of the idea that there are AI researchers at least designing uh, those algorithms. Yeah. So my question would be, how do you envision or how do you intend those biases to, like, be eliminated and then like improve or increase the search space and asking the right questions as you formulated it. But yeah, but that's a, that's a great question. I think in a way, that, yeah, can we actually bootstrap, you know, all the uh, uh, such a space, such a strategy, or have like a, some sort of uh, evaluation of the bias on the hypothesis space? So I, I think I don't know. That could be a pretty good PhD thesis. <laughs> <laughs> Any volunteers? Here we go. <laughs> And Sony's hiring, so you can get it at the same time. You can get paid to do your PhD. But actually, this is the same thing applied to like when you do engineering design. You know, how you're going to actually do all the search space, like, you know, with a specific, you know, uh, bias, for example, and it's successful that they go into that area, right? And it's probably like a less weight on the other area, which may have like a, uh, you know, significant uh, outcome. So it's really like a horizon problem, right? You know, so how much are you going to go beyond the horizon? So I think we should be able to mitigate that issue because the machine will go and generate rather than human generation. Human generation is a disaster. I mean, you can't really go that far mm. like a machine, but still like a, when you, you know, stop mm. like a, you know, hypothesis generation, what is the kind of a search dips, mm. you know, search breath, you know, mm. are we going to actually design that? That means that uh, our, we are imposing our bias, right? Yeah. So that can be automatically, uh, you know, uh, mitigated. You have to automatically correct it. That would be very interesting. Yeah. It's like a free run mode of the machine, yeah. uh, self-redefining in such a space and such a strategy could be very interesting. Then it becomes also kind of interesting to think about the typology of the biases, yeah. which yeah. Could, you could be implying or not implying. So that's interesting. Last and final question here before I'm, I'm going to ask him one. I'm going to get one. You get the last one. For so... For you to comment on it, so there's a, I just pulled up this, uh, this headline from BBC a couple of years ago. Most scientists can't replicate studies by their peers. Yeah. yeah. How does this fit in with... Yeah, a, a, that's a great point. I mean, it's a, you know, re reason what, you know, for the biomedical fields, like uh, some, uh, you know, success really depends on the how they do carry out the protocol. 
and it could be the case that like, uh, you know specific important part broker is not written in the paper, hmm. and it's almost impossible for the reviewer to notice that hmm. because you can't really go after the experiments, right? Hmm. You know, so like uh, if that's a little small thing, very difficult to replicate. Hmm. So like uh, with this, what we are trying to do is completely. I mean, well, probably significantly reduce the chance of the, uh, that kind of model behavior because everything have the protocol have to be there will be shared. Hmm. You know? well, even if it's shared, you can locked in and then, uh, when it's published and then you can lock it up, people will be able to access and they download and they get the uh, same. And so like, uh, also, the source of deviations, as I said, like a PCR you know, example, is uh, some uh, experimental uh, you know, biology says, like, uh, okay, we, we have this really good manipulations, so we are skilled. And they are not skilled. That's why they yeah, can exactly. replicate. You know, They're but like good. a machine will eliminate that kind of bias. Right? So, mm. you know, that issue which uh, we've mentioned now may not be completely eliminated. Yeah. Probably people do a lot of tricks, but like uh, you know, we may be able to significantly reduce the reproducibility problem. And the reproducibility problem in terms of the systematic uh, experimental procedure uh, deviation. Can be limited. The only thing you see left out would be the intrinsic variability of the uh, life, you know, uh, yeah. cellular system or the biological system. That remains there. Yeah. But uh, if you take a proper statistics, you should have a, uh, you know, characteristic statistics, a, and then you can tell, okay, well, okay, this is okay or not. Yeah. Presidential privilege. I just, <laughs> I just want to we make need, uh, a remark. To, yep. um, what Raphael said is specific to biology and medicine, right? <laughs> we don't have so much uh, problem to re repeat the experiments in other fields yeah. of, of science. Yeah. And what you are proposing is just to make it completely random. And so, you know, uh, it's easier, actually. Yeah. I, I just want to give another example. You remember when high TCs where superconductivity was yeah. discovered in yeah. 86? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, by the way, the discoverer just passed away uh, mm. uh, oh. a few days ago, yeah. uh, Alex Miller. And uh, there was a huge program launched in Japan to try random search yeah, yeah, for yeah, yeah, yeah. room temperature right, superconductivity. Right. Right. And the one who has the record is still a professor from ETH <laughs> who worked alone in his corner. And, and you know, mm -hmm. so I don't know. I'm still a bit skeptical about all this. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> yeah, but, but that gives no. like a little for the human scientist, exactly, <laughs> which is good. <laughs> he, Joel wants to keep the human in the loop always. Yeah. I think I appreciate that. I, I, but I opened with a question, and yeah. I'm going to close with it. Was the Iron Chef? Yeah. First of all, for those who, how many of you don't know what the Iron Chef is? Okay, so can you explain what Iron Chef is and why are you trying to create a robotic Iron Chef? This is like. Different topic. Oh, Iron Chef. Well, so this is like a you know Japanese version of the program, which is original, and the U.S. version. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, well, I think pretty much the same. But like uh, you know, the Iron Chef, uh, pretty interesting uh, TV program. I enjoy a lot. Uh, you know, for given the time constraints, like uh, you know, human uh, chef will, you know, with the constraints, uh, going to uh, you know cook something, which is nice. You know. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, so th so these are like yeah. world-class masters Master. of culinary yeah, creation. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you know, for the, uh, I, I think like uh, you know, why we want to do in the robot. Well, we, by the way, we have a gastronomy project in Sony AI. Really? Yes, we do. Okay. So we are hiring. <laughs> <laughs> I got a job, man. Thank you. I like my job. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, but I think, like, uh, you know, the thing, things like a biological experiments, and also, like, it's interesting because the gastronomy, you know, it, it's, a, you know, for how you actually manage the process and the precision. Mm -hmm. So, like, uh, even all the, uh, you know, the chef, the best chef, we were actually working with, the, like, uh, uh, numbers of Michelin three-star chefs. Mm. And uh, where they actually, for example, like, uh, you know, serve the plate, you know, at that level of the, uh, you know, for fine dining, time and the temperature and how you put that in a plate and when you serve in high precision. Yeah, exactly. So you can't really do the random thing and just bring it. So it's, it's not going to be like that. So it's, it's actually like taking the vegetable, cutting yeah, it cutting exactly, it, it, cooking keeping it. the temperatures, and then, you know, now, like, I guess it's waiting. Okay, now just everything's set, 30 seconds, 
the guest seat started eating. Yep. And then uh, that means like, uh, you know, five seconds before this, like uh, we should do this, to this and uh, two seconds before this, so the high precision manufacturing process. That's yeah, a totally. reality of the uh, top end. Yeah. And that's a uh, robotic system is best for that. I find we it are hiring. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I got a job. But, but it's going to be amazing. I mean, to think, I think that I want to say this is why I wanted to end with this. This vision, yeah. at the end of the day, for me, as, as um, I heard you were doing this, I was like, actually, if you never accomplish that, everything that we, you, we will have learned about how to smell, how yeah. to touch, how to hold, yeah. how to cut, to slice yeah. along the way would be phenomenal. Yeah. You know, and that to me is just an amazing yeah. vision, mm -hmm. which to me it sort of epitomizes so much of what you do mm -hmm. and have done is just as a visionary. Mm -hmm. And so for that, I want to thank you very, very much for coming and sharing your thoughts and your vision with us tonight. So let us give him a, a really a warm well, thank, thank, you. You. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Yeah.